Excellent. Thanks everyone for joining me. Um, Pierce wasn't able to make it today, so I will be stepping in in his place. Uh, for those of you that don't know me or don't recognize my voice, my name is uh, Spencer McIntyre. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started on uh, the Metasploit team demo meeting. I will be walking through the Metasploit framework activity and giving the update there. We have a whole slew of new content. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with new modules. Uh, so the first new module uh, exploits Ghost Cat, which is uh, uses a uh, vulnerability for CVE 2020-1938. And that was by a security researcher of Chantech and the Sun CSR team. Uh, next up was a memory dumping utility that actually leverages the advanced antivirus. That was pretty interesting. And that was brought to us uh, by DLL Cool J. Uh, we also received a AeroSpike database UDF Lua code execution, uh, which was implemented by uh, longtime Metasploit community member Brendan Coles and B4NY4N, uh, which exploits CV 2020-13-151. Uh, next up, um, our own Alan David Foster wrote an exploit along with uh, William Bowling for a GitLab remote uh, read uh, that could be leveraged to obtain remote code execution. Uh, this was a pretty interesting vulnerability because the remote read operation was utilized to leak a secret uh, related to the Ruby uh, on Rails application and then obtain code execution uh, that way. So pretty interesting to be able to turn that read vulnerability into a full RCE. So that was wonderful. Uh, in addition to that, we have flex.net CMS arbitrary ASP file upload uh, brought to us by Eric Winter. And so that was another great RCE module. And uh, two more. Uh, Hoodie brought to us another WordPress module. This one exploits a vulnerability in the email subscribers and newsletters uh, plugin, uh, which has a SQL injection vulnerability. And that can be utilized to uh, dump uh, the credentials out of the WordPress uh, database. And then uh, finally, we have a Windows Pulse Secure Connect uh, client safe password extractor brought to us by Quentin Kaiser, uh, which exploits CV 2020-8956. So you can go ahead and leak out the saved secrets for Windows uh, Pulse Secure Connect VPN clients. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a number of enhancements and features. Uh, the first to us was an update to the TP-Link uh, AC1750 uh, module from Pwn to Own, which was originally brought to us uh, by Paydrib. Uh, next up, we have a enhancement to the WebLogic admin handle RCE check that was brought to us by William Vu, who also implemented an improved check for the salt stack salt API command execution. Uh, so these check module improvements are going to go ahead and uh, improve the reliability and the stability of those check methods. Uh, so increasing the content or excuse me, the quality of the checks there. Uh, I myself also added the weak registry permissions technique to the existing service permissions uh, LPE module. This is going to go ahead and check to see uh, registry permissions and see if those can be leveraged to load a DLL on the target system, which is a new technique that was disclosed a few weeks ago. And then uh, B. Coles, uh, Brendan Coles also added the sync app, the publishing server target to the web delivery module. Uh, so that module has a growing list of targets and that is another uh, technique that we can go ahead and utilize to load code on the remote systems. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a Windows target that was added to the console service exec module by Real Matt Hours. Um, auxiliary support to the auto check mixin by uh, Alan Foster. Uh, this is a fantastic improvement for any of the module developers out there. The auto check mixin is quickly growing to be one of uh, the favorite mixins by uh, module authors. And so to be able to use that on auxiliary uh, modules is fantastic. So thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, I myself added in synchronization to the DLL payload template uh, to account for scenarios where the DLL would be loaded into a process and the payload would be executed multiple times to now only be executed exactly one time. Uh, I also added in a technique or a, excuse me, support for running local exploit modules through Meterpreter uh, as they could be with post modules previously. So that concludes our enhancements and features. Uh, we also have a number of bug fixes added over the past couple of weeks. Uh, the first up was uh, corrected headers for the uh, retrieved cookies. 
uh, and they get cookies for the uh, SPHP blog file upload. This is the, an older module uh, targeting the simple PHP blog exploit, and that was brought to us by first-time contributor Justin Partney. Uh, we also uh, received more exempt labels uh, from our very own D Welch for our uh, pull request automation. Uh, D Welch also added the requirements for the Python payloads and the dependencies uh, to address some issues that were there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Christopher Greenlease uh, added in a fix for frozen strings that were crashing when uh, the reload all command was being utilized. And uh, community member Dev Jan fixed a typo in the bypass UAC module. Uh, our own Jeffrey Warren uh, fixed an issue with Active Directory record object loads that under certain conditions was causing a, an unhandled exception. Uh, I myself added in updates to Railgun to fix some data types that were uh, misdefined, which would cause library functions to fail, uh, most often on some Windows 64-bit uh, systems. Uh, community member uh, Brendan Coles uh, updated the check code unknown to be a response for the NIM controller buffer overflow exploit module. Uh, our own Adam Galway converted the external MS1710 Eternal Blue Windows 8 module to only work on Python 3. It's a very popular module, and so it has uh, received some updates. So it's no longer in the Python days, but we have updated to Python 3, which is important and such. But a lot of systems running uh, Metasploit nowadays are shipping uh, by default. So that's a great improvement for that module there. <clears throat> And then uh, finally, the last bug fix was brought to us uh, by Matt Hagen, and that updated the XML import to utilize Base64 decoding on uh, the content body. And as always, uh, you can stay up to date uh, via the Metasploit Weekly Wrap-Up blog post on blog.rapid7. And we just really want to say that we appreciate everyone who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions. So thank you to everyone uh, that has been involved. Uh, we had a lot of content in the past couple of weeks. And so thanks to all the community members that helped make that happen. And uh, moving right along, uh, probably the most exciting part is let's see some of that content. Uh, through our first demo uh, from Grant, who is going to uh, show us the Pulse Secure Connect Credentials Gather module. Grant, are you ready? Yep, all good. Wonderful. Yeah, so this is an interesting bug where basically prior to certain versions of Pulse Secure and you connect client, um, the password for the um, VPN session would actually be saved in a way that could be retrieved by attackers but who are running as any user on the system. This has since been addressed in later versions so that you have to be running as the system user to actually get those, um, those passwords from the database, essentially. But um, we're just going to go ahead here and set up an example. So over here, I've got an outdated version of Pulse Secure. You can see it's running 9.1 release three, which was just prior to when they patched it. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, background our Jupyter session here. So that's just running as a normal user. You can see from the enabled process privileges, it's not a high privileged user, it's normal user permissions. Um, so excuse the fact that <laughs> I couldn't find the right commands for a second now. So yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and set the sessions to two. And we can see that since we don't actually have a session saved in the VPN, the module will correctly say, hey, the target is installed, but we don't have any credentials yet. So you can see there's no connections there. So I'll just go ahead and set up a quick connection there. Um, now you do actually have to have a Pulse Secure VPN server for this to be set up properly. If you just try to connect to any random server, it will not work. Um, so I'm just connecting to the server that I've got set up there. I'm just going to type in the passwords, username and password, and then click on the save settings. Uh, that will ensure that saves it correctly. Uh, this is just a warning about an existing session. So I'm just going to cancel that. And now we should see that it's waiting to connect. Um, so while it's doing that, we're just going to hop back over to our 
module and we're going to run it again and you can see if we find all the details now um, the module as it is right now does still print out the username um, field you can see that it's blank because basically unless you're running as a system user you can't actually gain that information um, but you can see that on outdated vulnerable versions, even if you run as a normal user, you can still gather a fair amount of information, such as the use the password, the IP address, and some of the details regarding like what is the name of the, um, the session file that they saved it as, for example, is like home VPN or whatnot. You can gather that information. That's awesome. Thank you, Grant. Seems incredibly valuable for attackers to be able to demonstrate that their credentials could then be used to connect to that VPN. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions for Grant? Nope. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'll just add one other thing. So if I just so that you're aware, if I was actually to run this module as a system user, we would have gathered the um, username as well. It's just that the permissions on the file that contains the username information are set to even on the older versions to only be accessible by a high privilege users. So that's why you're not able to gain that information. You can gain the password though. Cool. Thank you for clarifying that. All right, next up is going to be the memory dumper via the Advast antivirus. Uh, Brendan, are you ready? Yes. Perfect. So uh, inside uh, releases of Advast antivirus, uh, they were kind enough to put a utility in that will allow you to dump the binary from memory of any running file that you have the similar permissions to. Uh, so in this case, it's a wonderful example of uh, living off the land when you're going through and uh, performing uh, testing. In this case, it's a standard Windows 10. Uh, I believe in this example, I was using uh, version 2004, so it's very up to date. Uh, with the most up to, uh, with the most recent Avast antivirus release, uh, I'm running this as just a regular uh, desktop user. Uh, in this case, we'll uh, specify where we would like the uh, binary dump to go and what the PID we want to dump will be, also the session. In this case, uh, I believe I'm just going to dump a notepad process. Okay, so we see we've got a notepad process there. And so now using the, the Avast tool, we've been able to dump the, uh, the, the contents of memory for that process. And that's it. One thing I did think of just before we got here, this is a standalone EXE that's included with Avast. So it's not as though we were able to say dump LSAS as a lower privileged user. So don't get all excited about that. They, Avast did not uh, go ahead and have this all run as the, uh, the driver. So uh, you'll be limited to whatever permissions you currently have. But I was able to do uh, dumps of you know regular user processes like Notepad. Uh, I was able to dump uh, the Edge browser process, and uh, actually I was able to dump Explorer.exe as well. That's pretty cool. Um, I actually have two questions. Uh, is the dump format in like the standard mini dump format? I do not know. I believe it is. If I remember and correctly, when I did, I think I ran a file against it, didn't I? On the local machine? Oh, I was just about to do that when I stopped recording, apparently. All right. Uh, and the other question was, uh, do you know if that binary is signed? I do not. I would imagine it is. I was just as talking about this, thinking what a wonderful thing to include if you wanted to bring it up and sort of uh, use 
a tool that's signed by Avast during a uh, test. I can double check that and probably get back to you by the end of this uh, presentation though. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, it's just interesting. Thank you, Brendan. All right, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, um, so yeah, so this is a module for Aerospike database uh, for versions prior to 5.103, uh, sorry, 5.1.0.3. Uh, there's, uh, it, it allows the registering and execution of what's called user-defined functions. And so for vulnerable functions, uh, a UDF uh, that makes it called, so a Lua function called OS to execute uh, is actually allowed. And so what this means is that an unauthenticated user can actually register a UDF and actually gain code execution against the server by just registering and creating a UA, U, UDF. Um, and then you will get code execution as the user running the database. In this case, it's root. Awesome, thank you, Shelby. Uh, looks like you have a uh, second demo. Shelby, are you ready to talk about yep. uh, flex.net CMS? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so uh, flex.cms, uh, so uh, vulnerable versions of the software uh, has a, a file upload vulnerability, although it is executed, uh, sorry, authenticated. Um, so as an authenticated user, you can upload a file to a server uh, that meets some kind of criteria, like it has to have a certain extension, um, but uh, you can actually uh, rename the file uh, using like say uh, an ASP ex extension. So then you can get code execution on the actual target. Um, it's actually similar to the WordPress uh, demo I did uh, two weeks ago. It's just a simple um, renaming a file doesn't have the same checks that it does as when you would upload it. So yeah. Awesome, thank you, Shelby. That does seem to be a common theme in vulnerabilities you've seen lately, because I think there was another WordPress plugin that had uh, different different checks on that that uh, Hoodie had submitted a module for. Yeah, yep, that was the one, yeah. Awesome. Thank you again, Shelby. Uh, next up is going to be Alan Foster. Are you ready to show us the GitLab arbitrary read to RCE? Uh, yep, if you jump to the next slide. Uh, so yes, this is a module that targets uh, GitLab Enterprise Edition as well as Community Edition. Uh, in this slide, I'm just going to quickly walk through how the arbitrary read happens. Um, so the first step that this module will do is actually create two projects, and then it'll create an issue associated with the first project. And then the second step is just moving that issue from the first project to the second project. Um, so if you jump to the next slide, and the contents of that uh, issue is a little piece of markdown text, which is saying I have a, uh, an upload. And then whenever you actually move that issue over, GitLab behind the scenes will try to uh, move over any uploads from one issue to another. Uh, and as a result, you get an arbitrary file route. Um, so if you jump to the next slide. Um, so after I've created that issue, move to the second project, you can see that you can now just go ahead and download um, an, an arbitrary file from a, uh, whatever location you want. In this example, it's a Cedra password. Uh, but what this module actually does is leverages that to grab a secret key base value from Reels itself, and that allows you to sign cookies. And if you jump to the next slide, uh, what you can actually do is read out the secrets path. That'll allow you to sign your own cookies. And then we send a malicious Ruby payload uh, sort of embedded within the cookie itself. GitLab will receive this and try to deserialize it. So if you've got any real applications, um, you should configure your application to use JSON only cookies if possible. GitLab is vulnerable to this because it's making use of hybrid cookies, which can be a mix of either JSON or arbitrary Ruby code. Um, Yep, and again, this requires a username and password being set. And if we jump to the next slide. Uh, so just as you'd expect, you've got a check command and you've got a run command. Uh, in this scenario, you can see that because it's leveraging the auto check mixin, uh, even if you run it, it'll just quickly verify that things are sensical. You can see in this slide that uh, GitLab 12.81 is vulnerable. 
uh, you'll eventually get a slide. Most of the times you'll run as the Git process, uh, which is somewhat sandbox, but within that to Git user, you still get access to the Rails console, the database, Redis. There's still uh, quite a lot to, to pivot from there. And you can upgrade that session uh, as you'd expect to Meterpreter as well. So it's a pretty funky module. That's neat. Do we know how old um, that version of GitLab is? Uh, yeah, it's a few months old at this point. So it's from uh, GitLab 8.5 to 12.9 or so, and they're up to gotcha. 13 at the minute. Um, yeah, it looks like they're on 13.6. Interesting. Okay, cool. Cheers. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, does anybody else have any questions on the GitLab RCE? Uh, Spencer, if you don't mind me jumping back in, I can answer both of those questions very quickly in the vast dump. Oh, yes. Uh, number one, it is uh, the binary is signed by Avast, uh, and number two, it is in a mini dump format according to uh, the file command. Awesome! Yes, yeah, so that would be the uh, the common format that'd be used. Thank you, Brendan. No worries. All right. Well, that concludes our framework section of the demo. Next up is going to be Attacker KB. Um, so, Sunny, uh, I believe that you are uh, up for walking us through the Attacker KB updates. Yeah, that's right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Sunny, and I'm with the team that brings you Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base. I'm going to demo uh, a few recent updates that we've made to uh, Attacker KB. Um, in particular, a little bit of a, a backstory. When, when Attacker KB was um, you know, kind of first, uh, the first inception of it, kind of the thoughts around it, we were trying to, you know, identify what's a real quote unquote hot vulnerability, something that's meaningful in terms of, you know, attacker value and exploitability scores and CVSS scores, uh, which we traditionally see in, in the InfoSec space. We thought, oh, that's, you know, um, kind of, outdated or antiquated and a lot of people get frustrated with it. So we didn't really consider adding it to the application. However, for those of you following along at home, you may have noticed um, a few months back where we started to add some fields uh, around user interaction, privileges required and attack vector. And for those of you who are familiar with CVSS, you may recognize those as some of the base metrics. So it turns out that users are using Attacker KB quite often, and they're using it what as a knowledge base. So they've actually requested um, that we start to include the general CVSS metrics. So here we're exposing the uh, V3 severity and base metrics, which includes the base score and impact score and exploitability score. Um, as well as the URI, the vector URI. Now, this is the uh, kind of the first iteration where we thought we'll just display the information in table format. And we've got some great feedback from the UX team uh, where we're gonna actually add some affordances to group the attack vector and kind of uh, set it indented a little bit so that newbies who are not familiar with CVSS can map visually the different metrics with the actual um, kind of English phrase that goes with it, like a tax uh, complexity. Now, I will say there is a typo here. So there is a, uh, a bonus prize. I'll send you a guitar pick if you put in chat, um, if you can find that typo. And the clue is vector. All right, so that is the CVSS scores that we've added. Uh, that was done by Luis Sato. Now, we've also added a couple of, of actually rather simple UX improvements, but I think it goes a long way. I know for me anyway, um, under the in-app notifications, we have this nifty uh, sort of delete notification uh, feature here. And before, when you went to delete a notification, we would get that, you know, awful page, entire page refresh. 
And so Jorge Huerta worked on this and we've actually just made an Ajax call and it all happens in the background and you kind of get more of a, um, you know, kind of the, the current day sort of app behavior where you don't have to do a whole page refresh. So hopefully that um, will put some smiles on folks' faces. And then finally, Luis Sato also added a, uh, actually, well, not, I shouldn't say added, he, he removed uh, a requirement around assessments. So or when we first started rolling out the app, one of the key things we wanted was to be able to get great content um, from folks like Bob Brutus uh, and have them write up articles to sort of explain why they were assigning the attacker value and exploitability scores as they were. And recently we've noticed that some users actually just want to assign the scores. And what they'll do is just, they'll put a nonsensical blurb in the attacker, in the, uh, excuse me, the technical analysis field. So we've relaxed the requirement, the minimum requirement now is either including the attacker value or the exploitability score or writing a technical analysis. So certainly we would love for folks to be able to include all the information and you know the appropriate tags and write a nice analysis. But if they don't have time or perhaps they don't think that they um, are going to add more than that's already on this particular topic, then they can simply just add the score. There we go. And you'll see that the assessment gets added simply with uh, the score and, and no written technical analysis. So hopefully that will uh, encourage more people to participate and kind of eliminate the, um, you know, the, the twaddle or the nonsensical sort of scribbling in the technical analysis and, and kind of keep our, keep our application nice and tidy and professional. Yeah, I think we are all set. Thank you very much for that demo, Sonny. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. All right, well, that concludes our demo meeting for the day. I appreciate all the updates and the demos that folks provided here and thank you everyone for attending. So uh, have a great week, everyone. Excellent. <laughs>